Okay, so the last time we were reading together, um, Charlotte had her trunks brought in and they stored them below because her room was so tiny they couldn't fit everything in there and she was getting ready to settle in to her room and she got a warning um a mr barlow came and said that the crew wanted to warn her that she shouldn't be there and so she kind of i guess you could say put him in her his place um and she told him that she was supposed to be there. This is where she's supposed to be. Um, her father, you know, arranged for her to take this ship across the ocean. And remember, she's taking a ship that's part of her father's business. So, like, his business owns this ship. Um, and so he says, okay, well, I did my duty. I warned you. And he leaves. And she's kind of like, I wanted to run after him, but I didn't because that's not how I was brought up. And so here we are. Um... Indeed, I was less left with a despairing resolve never to leave the cabin until we reached America. Steadfastly, I shut my door. But by doing so, I made the space completely dark, and I quickly moved to keep it ajar. I was exhausted and desired greatly to sit down, but there was no place to sit. My next thought was to lie down. Trying to put notions of vermin out of mind, I made a move towards my bed, but discovered it was too high for me to reach easily in my skirts. Then suddenly I realized I must relieve myself, but where was I to go? I hadn't the slightest idea. So she wants to take a nap, but she's worried about like the little cockroaches and what other little animals might be running around that she saw before. And then she has to relieve herself. She has to use the bathroom. I don't know where that's going to happen. If you would be kind enough to recollect that during my life I had never once not for a moment been without the support, the guidance, the protection of my elders. You will accept my words as being without exaggeration when I tell you that at that moment, I was certain I had been placed in a coffin. My coffin. It's hardly to be wondered then that I burst into tears of vexation, crying with fear, rage, and humiliation. I was still stooped over crying when yet another knock came on my door. Attempting to sniffle my tears... I turned about to see an old black man who, in the very light of the lantern he was holding, looked like the very imp of death in search of souls. His clothing, what I could see of it, was even more decrepit than the previous sailors, which is to say, mostly rags and tatters. His arms and legs were as thin as a marlin spikes, his face as wrinkled and as crumpled as a napkin, with flecked with the stubble of a white beard. His tightly curled hair was thin, his lips were slack. Half his teeth were missing. When he smiled, for that is what I assume he was attempting, he offered only a scattering of stumps. But his eyes seemed to glow with curiosity and were all the more menacing because of it. Yes, I managed to say. At your service, Miss Doyle, the man smoke, spoke with a surprisingly soft, sweet voice and wondering if you might not like a bit of tea. I have my own special store, and I'm prepared to offer some. It was the last thing I expected to hear. That's very kind of you, I stammered in surprise. Could you bring it here? The old man shook his head gently. If Miss Doyle desires tea, Captain's orders, she must come to the galley. Galley? Kitchen to you, miss. Who are you? I demanded faintly. Zachariah, he returned. Cook, surgeon, carpenter, and preacher, two man and ship. And, he added, all those things to you, miss, in that complete order if comes the doleful need. Now then, shall you have your tea? In fact, the thought of tea was extraordinarily comforting. A reminder that the world I knew had not entirely vanished. I couldn't resist. Very well, I said. Would you lead me to the galley? Most assuredly, was the old man's reply. Stepping away from the door, he held his lantern high, and I made my way out. We proceeded to walk along the passageway to the right, then up a short flight of steps to the waist of the ship, that low deck area between fore and quarter deck. Here and there lanterns glowed, mast spars and rigging vaguely sketched the dim outlines of the net in which I felt caught. I shuddered. The man called Zachariah led me down another flight of steps into what appeared to be a fairly large area. In the dimness I could make out piles of sails as well as extra rigging, all chaotic and unspeakably filthy. Then, off to one side, I saw a small room. The old man went to it, started to enter, but paused and pointed to a small adjacent door that I hadn't noticed. 
the headness. The what? Privy. My cheeks burned. Privy is another word for bathroom. And on a ship, the head is the bathroom. My cheeks burned. Even so, never have I felt secretly so grateful. Without a word, I rushed to use it. In moments I returned, Zachariah was waiting patiently. Without further ado, he went into the galley. I followed with trepidation, stopping at the threshold to look about. From the light of his flickering lantern, I could see that it was a small kitchen complete with cabinets, wood stove, a table, and even a little stool. The space, though small, had considerable neatness with utensils set in special special niches and corners, knives placed just so, and an equal number of spoons and forks. Tumblers, pots, cups, and pans, all that was needed. The old man went right to the stove where a teapot was already on, hot enough to be issuing steam. He pulled a cup from a niche, filled it with a fragrant tea, and offered it. At the same time, he gestured me to the stool. Nothing, however, could have compelled me to enter further. Though stiff and weary, I preferred to stand where I was. Even so, I tasted the tea and was much comforted. As I drank, Zachariah looked at me. It may well be, he said softly, that Miss Doyle will have use for a friend. Finding the suggestion from him unpleasant, I chose to ignore it. I can assure you, he said with a slight smile, Zachariah can be a fine friend indeed. And I can assure you, I returned, that the captain will have made arrangements for my social needs. Ah, but you and I have much in common. I don't think so. But we do, Miss Doyle, so young, I am so old. Surely there is something similar in that. And you, the sole girl, and I, the one black, are special on this ship. In short, we begin with two things in common. Enough to begin a friendship. I looked elsewhere. I don't need a friend, I said. One always needs a final friend. Final friend? Someone to sew the hammock, he returned. I don't understand you. When a sailor dies on a voyage, miss, he goes to his resting place in the sea with his hammock sewn about him by a friend. I swallowed my tea hastily, handed the cup back, and made to go. Miss Doyle, please, he said softly, taking the cup but holding me with his eyes. I have something else to offer. No more tea, thank you. No, miss. It's this.